Okay. So, um, Revelation is, of course, where we're studying. Uh, we're up to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2. I'm just going slowly, really, you know, a couple of verses at a time, just because I think um, often there's so much to take in, you know. So I hope that's helpful to everybody. But anyway, um, we're going to look tonight at verse 12 and 13. And it's a new, a new church um, of one of the seven churches that we're looking at. And this church is um, the church in... Pergamos, or Pergamum, according to some translations, or even Pergamon. Don't quite know why it's got all these different, uh, different endings, but, but anyway, uh, it's Pergamos here, so I'll read it out to you. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days when, where in Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. So, interesting. Um, yeah, we'll get into what where Satan's seat is or where Satan dwells um, in just just a moment or two. But uh, just a reminder at the beginning of this that the person who is saying these things is not actually John. Um, he is simply the scribe. He's the one who's writing it down. And it's these are actually the things that the Lord Jesus is saying. So that makes it far more important, doesn't it? Uh, it's like, wow, this is actually Jesus who's saying um, these things. And he, Christ himself, uh, refers to himself as the one that hath the sharp sword with two edges. And it kind of reminds me of you know Hebrews where it talks about how the word of God is like this, this double-edged sword... It, uh, it's quick, it's living, um, and, it, and it's powerful. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily the meaning that, that's coming out here. It does refer to, to the Word of God, but here it's more referring to Christ, the manifest Word. And I think it's to do with um, Christ's own power, Christ's own authority, and the sense that, that, as we'll see later in the church at Laodicea, that Christ reserves the right to cut off those who will not repent. And I think that is the picture of the, of the sharp uh, two-edged sword. Let me just kind of um, uh, qualify that a little bit. If you turn to Romans 11. Romans 11. And we have an illustration in Romans 11 um, of an olive tree. And it, and it talks about how um, the, both Jews and Gentiles become uh, this tree. That, that uh, those Jewish believers that, that believed, those that believed in God, are kind of the natural olive tree. And that Gentiles have been grafted in. To that tree they've kind of been made part of it and of course the idea of you know the branch taking the sap and then producing fruit is in line with a lot of other texts in the scriptures isn't it you know Galatians talks about the fruit of the spirit doesn't it uh, Christ says I am the vine not an, not an olive tree this time but the vine but you get the idea it's the same kind of idea and um, and it goes on to talk about those who were broken off uh, about branches being broken off in 17 verse 17 it says some of the branches be broken off and now being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them so so broken off cut off amounts to the same thing doesn't it um, and so so in verse 19 it says 
uh, thou wilt say that the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, or good, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. So there's a warning in there, isn't there, for us? Uh, that Look, if God is going to um, cut off, as it were, those who were naturally speaking of Israel, then, you know, then don't, don't, don't say, well, don't boast about it. Huh? They were cut off, but I've been grafted in. They say, well, you stand by faith, actually, just like they did. And that's what standing by faith means, is continuing to be part of that tree, continue to draw your life, your 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 spirit from Christ Himself. You know that we remain, we abide in Him, we stay close to Christ, close to Him. Um, and so, I just wanted to kind of touch on that really, because I, I I think you'll get more of a sense of this as we go through Revelation, and particularly through these letters to the churches. The, that you know, Christ has that authority to to cut someone off if they are not um, if they're not living right, if they're not you know in Him and abiding in Him, continuing in Him. So again, verse thirteen of uh, Revelation two, say, Christ says, "I know thy works." This is kind of a pattern, isn't it? I don't know if you've noticed this. Every church he comes to, he's saying, "I know thy works," and it's sort of he knows. He knows those works that are not seen by men. You know, the things that, that, that we do that no one sees, Christ knows. He knows that work. He knows that good thing uh, that you did. Uh, and now on the other side as well, of course, he knows those works that, uh, that might be done uh, to appear before men. You know, like the Pharisees used to do, didn't they? They would stand on the street corner and pray. So everyone would say, oh, look, look at that holy religious man. Look what he's doing. Or they were, if they were giving something uh, to the poor, uh, they kind of blow a trumpet. So everyone would say, oh what's, oh, what's going on? Oh, look, he's doing a good deed. And do you remember what Jesus says about them? He says, uh, they've already received their reward. Mm -hmm. you know, men have seen them and said how great they are. Okay, that's the only reward you're going to get because you weren't doing it out of love you weren't doing it because you cared you were doing it because you wanted the praise of men so I think that's just another way to see it I know thy works Jesus said I know why you do what you do you know I know it when no one sees it and I'll reward you and I know it when you do it because you want you know because your pride needs that sort of praise of men and you won't get a reward for that um, so yeah I, I find this quite a sobering uh, I, I never really thought about Pergamos like this but the more I think about it I actually do find it quite sobering um, makes us really think about uh, what we do you know our actions why we do them and uh, he says to the minister it seems to be here because uh, remember we talked about the use of the word the old English thou uh, referring to one person you referring to more than one person um, so he seems to be saying to uh, the minister that the, the minister dwells where Satan's seat is uh, Satan's seat, Satan's throne is what he's saying and it's interesting, I did a bit of research on this that uh, Pergamos under the reign of Caesar Augustus was the first province to establish imperial uh the imperial cult of emperor worship you know like for 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 years i don't know how long hundreds of years i think it was there there was no emperor worship and then they got to this point where the emperors of rome were kind of seen to be like gods and they started to to worship them they gave divine you know attributes to them and this is the first place or the first province anyway that established this cult of of emperor Worship, so maybe that's what he's saying when he says this is the the place where Satan's throne, Satan's seat, is. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, John Wesley says that the the whole city was given to idolatry, 
quote, above measure. So there was a tremendous amount of idolatry um, going on in, in that city. Um, above measure. So, so I was thinking about this, you know, the, the worshipping of a statue, the worshipping of, um, of an idol is really, is, is akin to worshipping Satan, isn't it? That's what it's saying. Yeah, if it's if it's about idolatry and worshiping something that we put in place of God, then by calling it the the seat of Satan or the or the um, or where Satan dwelleth, is saying that to worship that idol is to worship Satan. Mm -hmm. They might not call it Satan, but that is in effect um, what is what is happening. And if you have a place that is full of idols. Um, then that might well be called, we might call it the seat or the throne of Satan. But hang on, isn't an idol just a lump of stone? Just a bit of, you know, a bit of wood, isn't it? Uh, or metal. And the Apostle Paul says, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. And that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many, and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. First Corinthians 8 verse 4. So, so Paul is saying, well, you know, an idol isn't anything. It's, it's not really a God. It's just something that, you know, men have made. Well, I came across this, like, interesting uh, verse in Deuteronomy. So I thought we'd take a look at it. Um, Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Old Testament. Uh, so it's sort of t right at the end, Deuteronomy 32. Uh, Deuteronomy 32 and... Uh, Talking about idolatry and verse 16. Pick it up in. It says, They provoked him, him being God, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up. Whom your fathers feared not. So, so what's that saying? They were actually sacrificing to devils or demons would be the, you know, the kind of modern, modern term when the when the AV when the KJV uses the term devils plural. It, it means demons rather than the devil. Okay, so so it's saying when when people were were worshiping these idols, these stone. Uh, figures or wooden figures or whatever they are, um, that that behind those behind those idols were devils or demons, um, and that um, I mean I've read you know accounts of where those supernatural forces have manifested themselves through through that. Uh, I mean I have a testimony of. Um, there was a woman that I knew uh, well, uh, but she, before she became a Christian, had been uh, involved in uh, witchcraft, um, basically been a witch. And she was saying that she had little stone idols and they would move, you know, when she kind of did certain spells, if they would kind of rattle and kind of move around, you know, not, not excessively, but, but supernaturally, you know, inexplicably. There wasn't, there wasn't, an explanation for it other than they were somehow being manipulated by some supernatural force um, uh, again you see it with you know Roman Catholic shrines where they have like an image a statue of Mary and people are bowing down to it you know or, or statues of saints you know being worshipped in contradiction to the word of God which says don't don't have an idol don't bow down yourself 
to an image that's been made by man. And there's all kinds of phenomena, isn't there? You see, you know, like statues kind of weeping or, you know, so on. And some of them usually have a natural explanation, don't they? It's usually like, oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's where it's built as it's kind of water seeping through or something. Uh, some of them have a natural explanation, but some of them don't, you know. Do they, can we explain all of them naturally? You know, then I think, you know, what is that phenomena? Well, it could well be a, uh, supernatural, it could well be a demon that is behind that. And as the person commits the sin of idolatry, then the demon begins to manifest uh, and show itself. Um, because whilst an idol is not God, and that's the whole point that Paul is making with that, that verse, where he says, you know, we know that an idol is nothing. He's, that's his whole point is to say, this is not God, because you made it. You know, then there's a passage in it. It's in Jeremiah, eyes. I always get confused between the two, where it says, oh, a man chops down a tree in the forest, and, uh, you know, he takes some of it, and he lights a fire, and he bakes his bread on it, and then the leftover bit, he kind of shapes it into a face, and it says, you are a god. You are my god. And it's like, it's foolishness, isn't it? It's just like, that's just silly, you know. Uh, and that's why the Bible puts it like that. Um, but, so whilst an idol is not God, um, that doesn't mean it's harmless. That, so behind every false and blasphemous religion, there's a demon. You know, and when you bow down, say magic words, invoke an entity, or enter into some kind of ritual, you are exposing yourself to dangerous forces uh, that you're probably not fully aware of who are involved in it are not fully aware they're deceived that's what the, the scripture says that the devil's blinded their minds so they don't understand what's what's happening uh, hence a place that's uh, full of idols is turned by Jesus himself Satan's seat that's where Satan is because you think about what they're, they're doing day after day they are blaspheming God day after day they are interacting with demons you know day after day they're performing um, rituals and saying words um, and the demons are soaking up that worship so uh, so what is the effect of the presence of Satan in that place well persecution persecution of the true church you know and that's what it'll always be isn't it um, and this goes way back, way back to the garden. Uh, let's quickly look at it. Genesis three fifteen. Uh, Genesis three fifteen, and this is God's judgment on um, on Satan for tempting Eve. And he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Uh, so, what we might call the, the malice of the persecutors against the people of God is the fruit of this enmity. You know, it will, it will go on. You know, Satan will attack uh, those who trust in Christ who will continue to stir up trouble for us uh, and for other believers around the world um, because he is attempting to bruise uh, as it were Christ's heel uh, but Christ will crush him will, will, will crush his, his head and the authority is the head you know um, so I think it's fitting then that uh, verse 13 of Revelation 2 um, finishes off with this personal reference to someone that Christ calls Antipas, my faithful martyr. Um, very little is known about uh, this guy, uh, Antipas, but it's kind of noteworthy, isn't it, that he gets a personal mention. You know, I mean, how amazing is that? You know, he suffered, but Jesus now calls him my, uh, what was it? my faithful martyr 
you know, he belongs to Christ and he was faithful, faithful even uh, to death. And I'm not sure whether there were other martyrs, uh, but uh, as they say, the part is put for the whole. You know, Antipas is representative of those martyrs, those who died uh, for Christ. Um, so, uh, as I say, very little is known about him. According to tradition, uh, Antipas was martyred during the reign of Nero, uh, the Roman emperor, by burning in a brazen bull-shaped altar. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but, but yeah, what's notable is he gets a mention. Jesus is saying, yep, yeah, this is my, uh, this is my uh, martyr. And, um, and at this time, what it's saying is, even when this kind of persecution was going on, awful, horrific persecution, the minister held fast to Christ's name. Um, uh, he says, uh, Thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith. Isn't that interesting? Because you think, well, surely it's you haven't denied your faith. Why, why does Christ say, my faith? What he's saying, in effect, is my religion, my, the worship of me. You know, the kind of the, uh, the faith that I expounded, that I taught you, my faith. And you haven't denied that. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because it's not just that you haven't denied Christ, but you haven't kind of tried to change that religion and come up with something that sounds like Christianity, but isn't really Christianity. You know, you haven't watered it down or anything. You've kept my faith, the faith that I taught you. Um, and so, uh, yeah, he's kept his faith and he, and he hasn't uh, denied, you haven't denied that faith, uh, even though, uh, this man was slain among you, it says, where Satan dwelleth. So, kind of, yeah, inspirational, is a good, a fantastic example of what, uh, of what Christ can do, you know.